I encourage you to be a part of that. We also have a churchwide fellowship happening as well, so you'll hear more about that um, in a few moments. But today we are starting a new series that we're calling Passion, It Wasn't the Nails. Tell your neighbor, it wasn't the nails. It wasn't the nails that held Jesus to the cross as much as it was his passion for us, his love for us, his commitment to us. And so over these next few weeks, we're going to describe that. We're going to share what the Bible tells us about that. And we're going to reflect on how that passion should impact our lives as well. But on, um, I'm excited also for the kids uh, that were baptized on yesterday. Come on, let's give God praise for those. Once again, um, we are excited because we know that baptism, as we talked about in the video, it really is in part a representation and a reminder of the fact that Jesus died but rose again. And so each time we see baptism, it's exciting, amen? Um, and it reminds us of, of what is to come. And so um, this is a visual representation, and I believe that visual representations are important. And it's important because it is possible for us to be distracted. In fact, I would suggest to you today that society as a whole, the church is included as well. We are very easily distracted. We are distracted by so many things that pull our attention and, and, and if we're not careful, can pull our attention away from things that matter. You know, one of the greatest distractions that I believe exists in terms of in, in the U.S. here and, and in the church today, um, I don't know if this image, did this image make it? If this, I want to show you what this is. Nope, that's not the image. You can come, <laughs> all right, uh, you can go back to that intro slide. The, the greatest distraction that I believe that we have today in the church, believe it or not, is cat videos. Now, what do I mean by cat videos? I'm not attacking cats, but I believe it's interesting. Did you know that um, in, in 2015, there were 2 million cat videos on YouTube alone? There were 6.5 billion cat pictures on the internet. And, and it's not that I'm attacking cats. How many know it's not a cat versus dog thing? But, but the thing is this, it's amazing to me how much time we spend on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, looking at things that really don't have significance but, and, and take our attention. The fact is they say that the average American spends about two hours and 14 minutes online. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with social media and looking at things, but when that consumes you, how many know you can you lose focus and lose, lose focus on what's important? This is, this is the thing that's so in, important. I believe that we, we, we focus our attention on things that, that capture, that entertain us. We focus on these things that, that distract us, and, and we also still have the things in life that we have to take care of. You know, after you finish watching videos, how many know you got to go to work? Amen. And, and some of us, we got to go in these jobs. We got to get our minds right before we go to work, and then when you got to go to work, you got to get your mind right after work. Come on, that takes some time. We got to take care of family. We got to take care of, of things that we have to do. And the reality is, um, there are so many things that come at us that sometimes it's possible to get so distracted and so focused on different things that, again, we can lose attention and lose focus on the things that mean the most. I believe the thing that means the most is not just this life, but eternity. How many know how you live life here matters and it impacts how you spend eternity? And if there's things that we need to focus on, I believe it's important to focus on the things that, that impact eternity. This is one of the reasons why I believe it's so important for us to continually reflect on the resurrection. You see, the thing that I want us to talk about today is this, this particular topic. Look at your neighbor and tell him, neighbor. Come on, tell him like you got something important to tell him. Tell him, neighbor, don't miss the point. Come on, turn to your other neighbor. Tell them, other neighbor, don't miss the point. We're going to talk today about the point of, of the crucifixion, the point of the resurrection. We're going to talk about Easter. And how many know Easter has nothing to do with Peter Cottontail? We understand that the resurrection and Easter has everything to do with Christ and him crucified. 
And this is important because I think first and foremost, each time we, we come to this Easter season, I find it helpful to just reflect on what happened on Easter and why it matters. I don't want to assume that everybody grew up in church and everybody knows this, so I'm going to do this very quickly. If you know this and you've been with us for years, uh, this is a repetition. How many know that repetition is the mother's skill? And if you see something over and over, you should be able to share with somebody else. Amen. <laughs> So I want to share very quickly this bridge illustration. We understand that the reason this happened is that if we go back in the book of Genesis, that God first created us. He created us to be in relationship with him. And when we were first created, we were created in the Garden of Eden in, in his presence. How many know you were designed to live in the presence of God? You see, you see, the presence of God would come down, the voice of God would speak, man, and, and woman would speak with God, and, and all was well. But then all of a sudden, sin came in. When sin came in, sin, man, uh, made a decision to violate God's will. Now, here's the thing about sin. God is like, it's like God is allergic to sin. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And when sin came in and when we, we decided to do our own thing, it caused walls of separation between us and God. We were moved out of God's presence, and unfortunately, there was nothing we can do about it. You see, there's lots of things that we try to do. A lot of people say, you know, I hope my good outweighs my bad. How many know you can't help enough old ladies across the street to earn your way into heaven? How many know you can't give away enough money? You can't serve enough time. You, you can't do enough to get you into heaven. This was a chasm that created that we could not fix. Here's the sad part, and this is the part. See, we always jump to the joy, but we got to start to understand what the problem was before we can experience the joy. The reality tells us that because of our sin, the Bible describes this as payment. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The truth of the matter is if, we, if this situation were not to change when we died, we were on our way to hell. We don't talk about hell a whole lot because it's uncomfortable. But how many know hell is real, just as real as heaven is? Hell is a place of eternal damnation, eternal separation, it's eternal agony. It's something that we don't want. But the reality is this was a situation we could not fix. This is why we're so excited about Easter. Because we know that Jesus came and died on the cross. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, he died in our place. And so he took the penalty of death so that we don't have to pay it. You see, as a result of this, we now have access to make it back to God. This is why we celebrate the resurrection. This is why we celebrate the crucifixion, because we understand that after Jesus died, he rose again, and he gave us access to God. How many of that know that's a reason to be excited on today? I, I think it's, it's critical to make sure we have that foundation, because that's the why behind the what. The what that took place 2,000 years ago was a painful what. And now I want to dig a little deeper and talk a little bit about how it happened. So you ask your neighbor how it happened. You see, the, the thing is this. We know the story. We know uh, we celebrate during Christmas time the birth of Christ and how, how God came to the earth um, in the form of man. And we understand the immaculate conception. And we, we know that story. We know that Jesus comes um, on the scene. He lives for 30 years. And, and after about 30 years on earth, he launches a ministry for the next three and a half years. He goes around preaching and teaching the good news. He lets people know that the kingdom of heaven has come and that, that God has come to have a relationship with us. And we also understand that at the end of that ministry, he begins to tell his disciples, those close to, closest to him, that he's going to be offered up to the religious rulers, to the Romans, and he's going to be killed. And he allows them to understand that this is something that was prophesied about hundreds of years prior. This is something that he has to fulfill because it's part of God's plan. And we understand that Jesus doesn't just offer himself up to die, but to be crucified. Crucifixion was the most horrible way to die possible. Crucifixion, the word crucifixion, it actually gives us the root for the word we have excruciating. You know when we talk about excruciating pain? It comes from this word crucifixion. You see, you see, Jesus, we know that he was handed over um, in, a, in a mock sham trial 
because we know the religious rulers were, were jealous of his ministry and wanted to, wanted to not only kill him, but they wanted to kill him in such a way that it was a public humiliation. So they stripped him of his clothes. They spit in his face. They punched him. They beat him in his head. They plucked out his beard. They took a crown of thorns. They jammed it in his head. They blindfolded him, hit him, and, and made fun of him. We, we understand that not only that, but then they took the cat of nine tails. It's that, that leather whip with bones in it, and they, they, they jammed it into his back, and they ripped off his flesh. We know that he was beaten so bad that the Bible says he was beaten so bad you could hardly recognize who he was. We know that after they, they beat him and after they, they, they tortured him, he, this was an ugly situation where he was almost unrecognizable. Why was this so horrible? I believe it's horrible because it demonstrates just how horrible sin is to God. How many understand that when we sin, it's not just something that just happens, but it hurts the heart of God? You see, we got to understand just how, how ugly this is because when, when we sin, the Bible says it's like we crucify Christ again afresh and anew. This is a painful situation that, that Jesus is going through and how he's going through it matters. It's, it's for a purpose. Tell your neighbors for a purpose. We understand that after he's beaten, and by the way, that, my first point was that the point was for purpose. My, my second point is that the purpose of the crucifixion was in fact for pain. You see, I, you know, the, the, when it comes to the pain, one of the most painful things, and, and, and I believe one of the most painful things that happened to Jesus was the nails that was dri driven into him. You see, when the nails were driven in, why do I say that I believe that was the most painful? Because he was already beaten. He was already scarred. He was stretched out on the cross, and, and his open back was in the wood of the cross that was already jamming into him. But then they drive the nails into his hands. That they drove the points of the nails. And, and the thing about it is the way they did it, the Romans, when they crucified people, the, the, the executioners, the, they, they were practiced and skilled at torture because they had to find the exact point to drive the nail. Um, you know, many times we see Jesus um, in, in images with holes in his hands, but we believe that the holes were actually here in the wrist, right below where these two bones come together so they could support the weight of his body. And they had to drive it just at the right place not to hit the main artery so he wouldn't bleed out because they wanted him to suffer over time. Many times people, when they were crucified, wouldn't die for days. It would take time for that, that painful agony pain to go forward because of how they executed it. But when they drove the nails into his hands... We, we understand that, that it, it drove, it, it cut not just on one side, but both sides all the way through. It reminds me of Isaiah 53, 5, which tells us he was pierced for our transgressions. We understand that, that when, he was, when the nail was driven into his, into his hands, we, that he was scarred for life. You know, as I was, it's, it's interesting, I, I look at some, some cuts and things that I have, and every scar that I have, or that I, have I remember where it came from. You know, it's, it's interesting, even whether it was significant or not. I remember when I scraped my knee. I remember when a dog cut bit my hand. I remember when I got fouled playing basketball. I remember every scar that's in my body. And we understand that the scars that, that were left in, in Jesus' body, we understand that there's memories associated with those scars. You see, and the, the memory that was associated with these scars was the fact that he was taking on our sin. To, to, it's one thing to understand some scars that are because maybe you were doing some things you shouldn't have done. But how many know when you're scarred for giving your life from somebody else, that scars that stands out in your mind? You see, Jesus was, was, was scarred. He was cut. He was bruised. We understand he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. But the good news is by his stripes we are healed. You, you, you see, you see that the nails were, were the points that, that, that helped to, to make that come about. Not only that, but, but there's something else important about the point of the nails that I want to highlight. Is that they were, not only did they cause scars, but they were the source of continual pain. Because why do I say that? Because not only did they just nail him to the cross, and that was painful when the nails went through his ankles and when the nails went in his wrist, but then they hoisted the, the cross up and dropped it in a hole so his entire body weight was hanging from the points of the nails. 
And as he was hanging from the nails, his body weight would pull his arms further and further apart, expanding his chest, expanding his lungs to the point where he couldn't get any relief. And when he wanted to get relief, he would push up with his feet, which would would radiate the pain that was from his ankles, from the nails here and from the nails here. For nine hours, the pain of the nails were radiating through his body. He was continually during that entire time in horrific pain. This is how we understand the love of God is here because how many understand when you get hurt, you, you many times react and we find out what's really on the inside of you. Oh, come on. You know, when you really get hurt many times, you may put on the front about what's on the outside, but when you're truly in pain, what's on the inside comes on the outside. Which is so amazing to me because as I see Jesus hanging on the cross, experiencing this pain for all of these hours, I hear him saying stuff like, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Oh, come on. Now, if it was any one of us, that would go a whole lot different. Oh, come on. We wouldn't be saying, Father, forgive them. We'd be saying some other stuff. Come on now. You bang your toe in the middle now. You got a whole lot less nicer words than that. But he would stay there, and while he was hanging there, he had time to do ministry. How many know when we go through pain, we're only concerned about ourselves? Why nobody is calling for me? Why am I going through what I'm going through? But Jesus, as he's dying and as he's gasping for breath, he uses his breath to minister to the person on the right. He says, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Oh, come on now. How many know you got to have some serious love on the inside? Jesus as he's hanging in agony, as he's hanging in pain, he's, he's hanging there and he's demonstrated that what's on the inside is his love for us. The nails, they, they not only continue to, to send pain, but they also secure Jesus to the cross. Now, I know it wasn't the nails that truly held him. He could have gotten down at any point in time. But we understand that as he hung on the cross, he, the Bible tells us that he became sin for us. He took on our sin, and as a result, that sin was what was nailed to the cross. And while it was hard to look at, it was hard to even envision, I'm grateful that he didn't get down off that cross. Because because he hung there and because he died, he took my sin that should have taken me out of here, and he took that down to the cross. You see, the, it, you see, because of the nails, he, it was nailed, it was secured to the point where I now have access to the Father, Amen. Which brings me to a point, my third point is that the point was that the power of God was to be revealed. You see, you see, here's the thing. What what Jesus understood and and what what he recognized was, was, by the way, this was all part of the plan of God. You know, one of the things that I, that I, when I look at how Jesus responded and how he acted, I look at what took place leading up to this. By the way, before Jesus got crucified, before he got arrested, you know when he got arrested, what he was doing? He was praying, talking to his father. And the thing that I find so powerful about this is I think there's a lesson that we can learn from this. Because how many know you're going to go through some painful situations in life? You, you may not ever go through crucifixion, but you're going to go through some stuff that may, that may pierce you. And, and what Jesus demonstrates is how do you go through painful situations? First of all, he went through it in the Garden of Gethsemane in prayer. We understand that he was praying before this happened because he knew what was going to happen. And he was saying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. I got to tell you, if there was one prayer, I'm so glad that God did not answer. It was that prayer right there. Because if the cup passed, all of this would have gone away. But, but he continued to pray because he was saying, Father, I, I really don't want to do it. And I don't think it was just the physical pain that was causing him to pray that. I think it was the separation from the Father. I think he understood what it meant to, what it meant to be separated from the Father. And he was saying, if it's possible, let this cup pass. He prayed that three times. And then finally, Scripture says, he finally said, but you know what, Father, nevertheless... Not my will be done, but let your will be done. I believe that when he prayed, nevertheless, not my will, yet your will be done. In his mind, he was crucified already. I believe that's when he died in prayer so that when he was able to go through, he said, listen, I've already given up my life. And so now it's just a matter of going through. How many know you can't do nothing with a dead man? Come on. You can't do nothing with a dead woman. You listen, you can't do anybody who's already died to themselves. You see, as Jesus goes through, he's, he's, he goes through this pain and he, start, and he understands, he recognizes where nobody else understands is the nails that pinned him to the cross were also the nails that enabled him to be lifted up. 
Ah, uh, you already understand that. He already understand that, that he said prior. He said, listen, I, I can hear Jesus saying it this way. You can beat me down. You can pull out my beard. You can strip off my clothes. You can spit in my face. You can put a crown of thorns on my head. But if you mess around and lift me up. If I get lifted up, you see, that's when everything changes. Why? Because I'm going to draw all men. I'm going to draw all women unto myself. You thought you were putting me up in shame, but I was put up on purpose. I was put up so that everybody can now have access as I intercede on your behalf. Oh, I'm so glad for the nails. I, they, they, they caused some pain, but I appreciate the nails because they enabled Jesus to be lifted up. They allowed me to understand that Jesus, in the middle of his pain, could still be lifted. They allowed me to recognize that no matter what pain I go through, I got to learn how to lift up Jesus as well. I can praise him when the sun is shining. I praise him when, he, when the bills are paid. But when the rain comes down and, and when the doctor's report comes out, when all hell breaks loose, can I praise him in the middle of my pain? Can I lift him up when I'm going through? You see, Jesus demonstrates, and I believe the nails help to illustrate the importance of how we have to raise Jesus. Amen. Tell your neighbor, lift him up, lift him up, lift him up. We understand that Jesus dies on Calvary because he's, he, was, he was going through his normal pain. And, and the, the Romans, they said, listen, and, and the religious rulers, they said, listen, we got to speed this up. Normally it could take days for people to be crucified, but, but we got stuff to do. We got, we got Passover coming. And so they started breaking the legs of the soldiers because they said if they can break the legs, then they can't lift themselves up anymore and they would die. They came to Jesus. He was already dead. So then they pierced him in his side. And they pierced him in his side. Blood and water came out. They said, wow, he's already been dead so far. So they took him down. They wrapped his body. They put it in a tomb. They were afraid because they understood that he said that something was going to happen after he died. <laughs> they said, we can't. It didn't. They, you see, the Romans, the Romans thought it was over, but the Jews said, wait a minute. It's not over just yet. So we need to make sure he doesn't come out of this thing. They wrapped his body. They put a huge stone in front of the tomb. They put a seal on it and said, don't ever move this stone under the authority of Rome. They put guards on the outside. They said, there is no way he's going to get out of this. We just need to hold him in the grave for at least three days. But we understand that the story didn't end there. <laughs> three days later, I, at the old church would say, early on Sunday morning. <laughs> Oh, come on. There was something happened early on Sunday morning. It, we, we didn't hear all of the details, but we saw the result. We know the stone was rolled away. The, the, the clothes that wrapped him was all wrapped up. The shoulders were knocked out, and Jesus' body was gone. How I many of you can't find his body anymore because it's not there? Tell your neighbor, it's not there. It's not there. You say three days later, Jesus got up out of the grave. Praise God. That's what makes today a celebration. Because if he never died, this would be a sad, sad song. But because he lives and because he went to the Father, we now have access to eternal life. This is why we celebrate. Because the power of God raised Jesus from the grave. You see, you see when Jesus got out of the grave... It wasn't enough. He spent the next 40 days just walking around saying, hey, I'm back. <laughs> let me just let you know I'm still here. <laughs> Why did he do that? Because he allowed people to understand, listen, crucifixion was the worst thing possible. And if I survived that, if you just threw the worst that you could after me and I survived that, there ain't nothing else that's going to stop me. I already defeated death, hell, and the grave. I've defeated the worst. What you got to understand is the same power that raised Jesus is available in your life on today. You see, I don't care what your situation is. How many know that if he can resurrect Jesus, he can resurrect dead relationships? Oh, come on. He can heal bodies. How many understand? He can turn situations around. You see, you got to understand that same power that raised Jesus from the grave is available in your life today. You see, you see Jesus as he's spending time walking around. He, there's, there's an instance that happens in John chapter 20. You guys didn't think I was going to do this without reading scripture, did you? I hope the scripture's to here. Thank you, Jesus. All right, John chapter 20. This is something powerful as Jesus is showing himself. Verse number 24, the NIV. It says, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not, when the, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. 
But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace with you. Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. You see, you see the, the thing about the nail marks that I found so profound is that after Jesus was raised from the grave, the first thing that I find that's, that's, that's so interesting about this is that as, as, as Jesus is raised from the grave, his body had been healed because we know he was beaten so badly that he couldn't be recognized as a man. But now he was, he was healed in his body with the exception of the holes that was in his body. All of his wounds were healed except for the nail prints that was in his hands and in his feet and the holes that was in his side. And my question is, why is it that, that God would raise Jesus and leave the holes? I believe he left the holes to have verification that it was him. I believe he could have healed over everything, but he left the scars because he wanted to demonstrate and confirm that this wasn't an imposter that, kept, that was saying he was Jesus. This was the one who was crucified. And it was because of those holes that, Pete, that, that, that Thomas was able to verify. Now, I appreciate Thomas because Thomas is a logical person. Where are my logical people at? Oh, come on. You understand that people can tell you something, but sometimes folks say stuff. How many know you can't believe everything everybody says? Thomas was saying, now, wait a minute, let me see. He says, I'm not going to believe until I can test. Now, now Jesus ultimately rebuked him. He said, believe anyway. But he said, listen, I want to give you proof. And there's sometimes in your life that God will do something in your life to just verify, to let you know that he's still on the throne. I wonder if God has ever done anything in anybody's life. If he's ever showed up, if he's ever opened up a door where you said, nobody but God could have done that. Many times what God does is he'll just show that just so you can have faith for the next thing that's going to happen. Amen. You, you, you see, he, he allows him, Thomas, to see the, the nail prints in his hands. The nails allowed him to validate and verify who he was. You see, the nails accomplished a few things. They held Jesus up. They validated who he was. But the other thing that, I, that the nails did that I think we need to actually celebrate is that when the nails went through him, they allowed blood to flow. I think you need to understand that, that blood was important to flow. Because, because of the blood of Jesus, when it flowed, it changed everything in our lives. You see, the reality is this. We understand that when it's because of the blood of Jesus that we are, if we feel distant, that we can be brought close to God. In Ephesians chapter 2, 13. You see, we got to understand that even though we many times were, were lost because of sin, we've been brought back because of the blood of Jesus in Ephesians 1, 7. We recognize that although we, we don't even necessarily need to point to Adam and Eve for sin because we've sinned on our own. Come on, some of us are pretty good at sin. We have racked up some experience in sinning. We understand that because of the blood, it justifies us from our sin to the point when that blood is applied to our life. God says, listen, the verdict is not guilty, not because you weren't guilty, but because you were justified because of the blood. You see, you see, it's the blood that allows us that when we go through to overcome in Revelations 12, 11, it says by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony, we overcome. We understand that the blood ultimately washes away our sin in 1 John 1, 7. I need you to understand I'm so grateful for the blood of Jesus. I, I appreciate the blood that was shed on Calvary. I am so thankful because of that blood which came through what he did on the cross. You see, the thing I need us that, that to understand on today is that as we reflect back on the crucifixion, as we reflect on what took place on Calvary, we should recognize that ultimately what that sacrifice did and what, what Jesus went through should uh, help us to understand just how much God loves us. You see, when you think about his pain, you think about his suffering, it has to allow you to realize that only somebody who loves you would go through all of that for you. You see, no greater love has this than one that would lay down his life for a friend. 
And we understand that when Jesus died on Calvary, he demonstrated what true love is. You see, on today, I I want us to just reflect on this moment, even as we celebrate the resurrection, as we celebrate new life. We should reflect and celebrate on the fact that because of the love of God, we now have access to the Father. Come on, let's stand all over this place. Today, I want to encourage us, even as we consider the point of what took place, the point was, was not just to have some time off from work. The, time, the point was not for us uh, for to do uh, different celebrations of eggs and things of that nature, but the point is to celebrate the fact that we now have access to eternal life. We realize that the pain that, that Jesus went through was to just demonstrate how much love the Father has for us. I want to encourage us, even over these next few weeks that come, For us, even when we are potentially uh, able to focus in different areas and potentially uh, get distracted by different things, to intentionally take time to reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus uh, paid for us. I I want us to take a moment and to reflect on what he went through for us. I want us to take a time to remember his, his pain. You see, I believe that when we reflect on that, it's going to do one thing. It's going to make us grateful. It's going to make us appreciative of of what he's done. It will draw us closer into himself. And we realize that was really the point because at the end of the day, the father wants to bring us back into a relationship like he did in the beginning. I I showed this illustration at the start, but there was one part I didn't finish. You see, I I showed the illustration of the bridge and I showed how we we now have access to God the father. But the truth is that really doesn't matter. The story that I just told doesn't matter. The crucifixion doesn't matter if we don't accept that sacrifice. You see, this is us when we start on one side, but what we have to do is we got to be willing to cross over. Come on, go ahead and click that one side. We got to be willing to cross over to the other side. (laughs) Hallelujah. Listen, listen, I want to I want to just tell you right now, if you're here and you say, listen, man of God, I heard what you said. If you're watching online, you say, listen, I get it. I understand. But the thing is, I haven't crossed over. You might have been in church your whole life, but you haven't accepted Christ. You you, maybe you've accepted and you've walked away. Maybe you'd say, listen, I'm struggling. You know what's funny? Every time I witness to somebody, every time I show this example and I ask people, where are you? You know what they tell me? They tell me, well, I'm really here. And what they're trying to say is I'm halfway. How many know there's no halfway? Come on, it's like being half pregnant. It doesn't happen. Come on, you've either accepted, you've either followed him as Lord, or you haven't. How many know you're either in or you're out? Come on, God doesn't do halfway. Today, I want to give you an opportunity to go all the way over. I want to give you an opportunity to make sure that when you die, you're able to stand justified before the Lord. I want to give you an opportunity to experience new life. Maybe you've never experienced today. And listen, we do this each week, and it may seem simple, but I need you to understand it's because God loves you so much that he made it so simple. What he said is we first have to believe in our heart, and then we have to confess with our mouths. Now, as we pray this prayer, I'm going to ask that everybody will repeat this prayer after me. And as you do, if you pray this prayer in faith, that's going to enable you to cross over to the other side. Come on, I want everybody to pray with me. Lord Jesus. I confess that I am a sinner and that I need you in my life. I believe that you died and you rose again for my sins. I commit my life to you. Father, right now, I thank you for those who just prayed that prayer and believed it in faith. God, you said in your word that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouths that you are Lord, that we would be born again. And so, God, I say thank you right now for those that have crossed over, maybe for the first time, those who have rededicated their life to you. God, I thank you that even moving forward, God, that they would reflect upon the bridge that they crossed over, the cross, the crucifixion, the pain, the agony that you went through. But most importantly, that they would reflect on the fact that you have given them access to new life. So God, we say thank you right now. God, we give you praise right now. God, we give you glory. God, we appreciate what you've done. Oh, come on. If you appreciate him, just go ahead and tell him thank you. If you appreciate him, why don't you go ahead and just praise him just for a moment. God, we worship 
God, we're more excited about what you've done than our team winning a, a championship. We're thankful, God, because you didn't just help us out of a bad day. You helped us out of eternity from hell. We're thankful, God, because, oh God, you've given us access to the throne of grace, God. We can come back into relationship with the Father. We can have peace, oh God, that passes understanding. We can have joy that's unspeakable, God. In spite of what we face, we can have hope, God, that you can turn things around because of what you've done. Lord, we bless you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we magnify you. Lord, we